Welcome to my classroom. In this fuel cells and batteries course, in lecture number one, we have seen the introduction to these fuel cells and batteries, and in lecture number two, we have seen the need for alternative energy technologies, and in lecture number three, we have seen the definition of fuel cells and its applications, and in lecture number four, we have seen the history of fuel cells. In lecture number five, we have started discussing about the classification of fuel cells, and we have seen about what is alkaline fuel cells and phosphoric acid fuel cells in this lecture number 6 we are going to discuss about pim fuel cells polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cells which is having wide applications in uh, portable devices and stationary uh, vessels and particularly in electric vehicles ev vehicles we are finding its application so the scope for pim fuel cells is more so we are going to discuss in detail about these pim fuel cells in this lecture number 6 ready to just recap we have seen fuel cell has a wide scope of applications and the hydrogen can be produced from various sources and that can be used in a different type of fuel cells and we have seen about alkaline fuel cells pim fuel cells phosphoric acid fuel cells molten carbonate fuel cells solid oxide fuel cells proton exchange membrane fuel cells are some of the application classifications of fuel cells okay in this some of them are low temperature applications some find applications at high temperature operations okay and some of them are preferred for portable applications and some of them are preferred for stationary applications okay and if you look at the operation or the chemistry behind it we have seen that hydrogen is entering in the anode side where it becomes a uh, Uh, protons h plus protons uh, and electrons are getting separated so electrons will be passing through the uh, cathode side through the external circuit thereby generating emf which we get where we get a dc current and uh, these h plus ions the protons will be passing across the membrane or uh, the electrolyte and that will be reaching the cathode side and in the cathode side we are passing the oxygen into the system where this oxygen H plus and the electrons form the water molecules, which is a byproduct which needs to be taken out with the oxygen as it is escaping out. Okay, so that's what happening in a typical fuel cell. So always we are continuously supplying the hydrogen and the oxygen. So you have H plus ions going through the electrolyte, and we have electrons passing through the external circuit. Okay, so this is what we have seen. And this is the chemistry behind the thing, and the overall reaction taking place is H2 plus O2 giving water is the overall reaction, and we have a reaction taking place at anode and cathode. But that it's not a simple reaction; it may involving some multiple step, which we will be discussing in detail separately in another lecture. Okay, coming to this lecture number six, we are going to discuss about PEM fuel cells. Okay, what is PEM fuel cell? It's a polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cell. So these polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cells are also called as proton exchange membrane fuel cell or solid polymer electrolyte fuel cells. Okay, this SPE reactor we call it as SPE reactor. SPE refers to solid polymer electrolyte reactor or PEM, which refers to polymer electrolyte membrane. Yes, the difference here is the electrolyte is not a liquid anymore. So it's the electrolyte is a membrane. Okay, membrane saturated with some acid, so it will be uh, membrane will be allowing the ions to pass through it. Okay, so in general, this when in it is dry, the membrane may not be conductive in nature, but if it is saturated with water, this membrane will be conductive in nature. So that by we can have the system where we are allowing this uh, membrane to act as an electrolyte that is selectively allowing only the cations or anions protons or anions to pass through it and it does not allow the passing of any raw material or the product formed during the course of the reaction and that it it does not allow the electrons to pass through it okay so that way this a polymeric membrane will be acting as an electrolyte in this type of reactor okay so this can be operated below the boiling point of water so we have low temperature uh, applications for this type of uh, fuel cells so 
So this proton exchange membrane or polymer electrolyte membrane, it is used as a polymeric electrolyte in this system. So this proton conducting polymer, it forms the heart of the heat cell and the electrodes. So these electrodes are generally anode and cathode where we have uh, carbon uh, which is coated with some precious metal like uh, platinum. Okay, so it's like a sandwich made, a membrane is in the middle, in either side of the membrane we have anode and cathode, so we make a sandwich out of it which is called as membrane electrode assembly, so MEA, this MEA is the membrane electrode assembly which is made up of uh, an electrolyte uh, sandwich between an anode and cathode that also uh, usually a uh, <coughs> your uh, carbon cloth on uh, which we have platinum is being coated on it okay so that is what a pem fuel cell is and if you look back at the history of pem fuel cells it was invented by the us company called as Gen general electric ge and it was initially intended for military applications so they were developing this type of pem fuel cells mainly for military application However, looking at its functionality, it has uh, its advantages were recognized by the NASA. So, what they did, they used these PIM fuel cells for the manned space flights. Later, they have to, it has been replaced with uh, alkaline fuel cells. But first, they preferred this PIM fuel cell because it's lightweight. Okay. So, but at the same time, this lightweight cell were also auto attractive for the automobile application. So that's why if you look at the sea submarine. Uh, applications uh, even in land uh, land based vehicles they in transport vehicles they have been used particularly in submarines okay and this is usage has attracted a lot of investment and the pump fuel research was going on well and that's why it is a, became a main candidate for power supply for electric vehicles okay in 2015 we have a lot of electric vehicle coming into picture with the fuel cell as the power source. So after that, this PEM fuel cell is dominating the market for particularly for electric vehicles. Okay, so the usage of PEM fuel cell has got a exponential increase in demand once this electric vehicle started using PEM fuel cells. Even in Japan, they are introducing PEM fuel cell home. In every home, they want, the government is giving some funding subsidiaries to introduce at least one kilowatt of uh, power generating pump fuel cell at every home. It's like every domestic uh, applications, so they are implementing this up to one kilowatt um, pump fuel cells at every home. So thereby there is a increased power because even though initial research at the US and Canada were dominating in uh, developing all this pump fuel cell research because of Japan doing it in the large scale domestic applications, and it has been taken over by the Japanese research team. Okay, so that's the research scope for PEM fuel cells. And <coughs> the, the, this because these PEM fuel cells are lightweight. Lightweight is very handy when you talk about these portable devices or when you talk about transport vehicles. However, for stationary applications, space is not a constraint, so the weight is not a constraint. So there, this overall efficiency comes into picture if you want to dominate the market with PEM fuel cell in the stationary applications. So that's why overall efficiency is the key factor when you discuss about the fuel cell applications for stationary applications. So there we have our heat recovery, water usage, water reuse, all this needs to be taken care. This cell is highly efficient when provided with hydrogen fuel. Remember, we have seen that it's not the hydrogen is the only fuel for fuel cells. In place of hydrogen, any hydrocarbon containing hydrogen can also be used, but there will be an additional unit like steam reforming unit, which will be converting the hydrogen containing hydrocarbon into hydrogen. So obviously there will be some byproducts also formed, right? Mm. That way, this uh, this particular PEM fuel cells are highly efficient when you use hydrogen as a fuel. However, it can be used for other uh, fuels like hydrocarbons also. Okay, so if you look at the history, you can see that Germany spacecraft people they are using this uh, PEM fuel cell which is being installed in the spacecraft, and this program early used uh, this PEM fuel cells only. But later on, it has been replaced with alkaline fuel cells, as I was telling you. Okay, so that way, this particular uh, fuel cell, which was designed for this Gemini uh, spacecraft, 
uh, was a one kilowatt power plant with three stacks of 32 cell each. So one stack contains 32. So 32 into three, that much uh, stacks were there. So we are getting around one kilowatt of power. Okay. So that average power generated was around 620 watts. And what they, how did they store this hydrogen and oxygen for the spacecraft? They have been liquid form they have stored that is in a liquid form that is cryogenic conditions under cryogenic conditions the hydrogen and oxygen were stored in the form of liquid okay so these cells were operated at around 21 degrees Celsius as I told you PEM fuel cells cannot be operated at high temperatures so they are effective at lower temperatures so they try to operate it at 21 degrees Celsius okay then they used uh, what electrode was used the titanium screens with uh, platinum catalyst were used was the electrodes anode and cathode so the actual membrane in this fuel cell was made with the sulfonated polystyrene resin that was the polymeric membrane which was used in the spacecraft the gemini spacecraft okay so the pem fuel cell used in the gemini spacecraft used which membrane they used sulfonated polystyrene resin okay and in 1967 a similar cell was adopted for a bio satellite spacecraft but in this case, they started using a new type of membrane, which is uh, the sister of uh, Teflon. Uh, okay, so that is uh, named as uh, Nafion, which is a perf perfluorosulfonic acid ionomer based uh, membrane. So, which was even actually developed by DuPont Company. Remember, till today, the market for polymer electrolyte membrane is dominated by this DuPont's product, which is Nafion, because there is it is undisputed leader in the membrane with its performance and its durability okay so that way because a uh, lot of research is being carried out and alternative membranes have been uh, reported in the literature because basic research is done and alternative has been found but none of them were able to match or uh, overperform with uh, in respect with respect to or in comparison to this nafian membrane Okay, so that way even the research in India also very limited people are working on the development of membrane for fuel cell applications because one is funding, another one is the performance is not matching up to the Nafian membrane which is by leader DuPont. Okay, so that is the case. So that's why this polymer is being used in the most of the commercial applications. Okay, so this polymer membrane which gives the name to this which gives the fuel cell its name is constructed uh, is the from the backbone compound that is close relative of the teflon as i told you that nafion is a uh, similar structure to this teflon but it is an improvised version so that because this backbone has an acidic molecular group attached to it so what happens is in the normal state this membrane will not be conducting the protons but if it is saturated with water then the acid molecular groups release protons conveying uh, conductivity via the water within the membrane. So, consequence of this conductivity being conferred by water, the membrane must be kept below the boiling point of the water. That's why I told you that uh, the, bio, it, it, the maximum up to 80 degrees Celsius only, this type of fuel cells are being operated. As I told you in Gemini spacecraft, they operated it around 20 degrees Celsius, right? So, this is relatively a low temperature for a fuel cell and it makes its electrolyte catalyst which is usually platinum susceptible to poisoning because lower the higher the temperature efficiency is going to be more and if it is low temperature it is susceptible to poisoning also okay so that way this type of fuel cells can achieve up to 60 percent efficiency when we are using pure hydrogen as the fuel not hydrocarbons okay so in, if you are using hydrocarbon we cannot expect up to this 60 percent efficiency whereas the efficiency can be less than that okay and it's a typical uh, structure assembly of a polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cell so this is a polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cell so what we will have is, as I told you, it's a membrane electrode assembly, which is a, a sandwich of uh, your uh, membrane between an anode and a cathode. Okay, so hydrogen is supplied to the anode side, oxygen is supplied to the cathode side. Okay, so there will be bipolar plates, which will be allowing the flow, which will provide the flow field for the gases to pass through it. Even the water formed has to be escaped through this space 
in the flow field in the bipolar plates okay so bipolar plates are important part in time in this type of proton exchange membrane they actually they are the costliest part in the polymer electrolyte membrane assembly also okay so if you look at the, what is happening in this first if you look at hydrogen fuel is channeled through the flow field plates to the anodes on one side of the fuel cell while oxygen is channeled to the cathode on the other side of the fuel cell okay so hydrogen and oxygen are entering and if you look at the second point what is that at the anode a platinum catalyst causes the hydrogen to split into positive hydrogen ions and negatively charged electrons as i told these electrons will be passing through the external circuit causing an emf generation which is producing a dc current okay and third point here is we have at the middle of this thing as the heart of the fuel cell uh, pem fuel cells so you have a polymer electrolyte membrane which allows selectively allows the positively charged ions to pass through the to the cathode the negatively charged electrons must travel along an external the, if you see this is an uh, external circuit from anode to cathode this uh, electrons will be passing through this external circuit causing an emf generation and at the cathode what happening the electrons the positively charged hydrogen ions with the oxygen it forms water which is a by product which also flows out of the cell so this is what typically happens in a pem fuel cell remember as i told you when when uh, this membranes will not uh, conduct the protons through it when there is no water so that's why this operation of this pem fuel cell is extremely sensitive to its water content it cannot be too low it cannot be too high in both cases we have issues okay so the operation is not at its optimum or if not efficient when the water content is not within the prescribed range okay so what is happening the cell reactions is producing water at the cathode so we need not supply water externally we need not supply water externally to saturate the electrodes okay so once it starts uh, water is being formed so that water will be saturating the membrane so initially once you switch on this membranes will get saturated with water which is being formed at the cathode side okay so the cell reaction produces water at the cathode and it must be carried away from the cell otherwise the cell might get flooded preventing the hydrogen and oxygen gases from reaching the electrode so whatever we cannot have all the water that is formed during the reaction to stay within the system so continuous removal of water is important to avoid the flooding of water in the pem fuel cells and how we can achieve it by passing the oxygen air at a higher flow rate or using some excess air to the system we can uh, make this uh, air carry away all the water within the not all the what required amount of water from the fuel cell so that way we are achieving the removal of water by using excess air to carry the away carry away the water which is produced in the liquid form at the lower operating temperature when you are operating above 100 degree celsius remember the water will be in the gaseous form so if we should know the phase in which the water is produced even though the overall reaction is h2 plus o2 giving water when you want to write the phase it is hydrogen is in gaseous phase oxygen is in gaseous phase water will be in liquid phase when the operating temperature is less than 100 degree celsius and it's going this water formed will be in vapor phase if the operating temperature is more than 100 degree celsius okay and that's why we are saying in low low temperature operations this in pem fuel cells water is formed in the liquid phase which needs to be carried taken away so for that we will be using some excess air percentage okay uh, it is important to prevent uh, too much water is also being carried away will cause problem because we need uh, we need to have a minimum amount of water so in general what we do we send a humidified air into the fuel cell system because initially it needs some water conductivity needs to be there in the membrane so always we send the gas stream which is always
So when we say that it is a low operating temperature, what does it mean in other way? Low temp, lower the temperature, lower will be the rate of the reaction. Okay. So it means that the cell reaction must be catalyzed with some noble catalyst so that it can increase the reaction rate. Okay. So a costlier catalyst is required when you are operating below. Uh, the uh, this temperature. So when you are operating at low temperatures, we have to use some costly catalyst, noble metal. <coughs> Sorry. When you are operating at uh, room temperatures or lower operating temperatures, we need to use noble metal catalyst so that it can accelerate the reaction rate. Okay, so so that the cell is viable. And even with this catalyst, the speed of the reaction that is taking place at the cathode is slow. Okay, so that is the reaction taking place at the cathode side, that is that oxygen reaction, oxygen, H plus ions and electrons combine to form water. That reaction is taking place slow when you are operating at this low temperature. So that is going to be a limiting factor in the overall fuel cell, PEM fuel cell operations. Okay, and remember the use of a membrane electrolyte makes the construction of the PEM fuel cell relatively simple. Okay, as I said, you make a sandwich connect the bipolar plates and fix it in a frame, your fuel cell is ready. So the construction of a PEM fuel cell is relatively simple in comparison to other type of liquid electrolyte fuel cells. Okay. So these electrolytes, electrodes of the cells are normally made of carbon particles that have been coated with noble metal catalyst, precious metal catalyst like platinum, gold, silver. Okay. And a complete membrane and electrode assembly will be around even a small thickness of 200 micrometers. So that much thin, thin fuel cell is possible to make. Each cell will be around 200 micro mm thick, micrometers thick. Okay. And this backing layer of this porous carbon often treated with the Teflon to prevent water logging and is then applied to each electrode. Okay. So even in this, when you call this backing layer, they are also up to 300 micrometers thickness, which serves multiple functions. What they do? They provide mechanical strength to the cell assembly. They also act as a current collector and they provide a porous layer for the gases like hydrogen in the anode side, oxygen in the cathode side to diffuse through the electrodes and the water can also be removed. Okay. So that way this backing layer which is made up of this Teflon coating on the porous carbon is being used. Okay. So this is a typical catalyst which is being used for PEM fuel cells. Even in my PhD work we have prepared several membrane electrode assembly that is a sandwich of a membrane electrolyte between anode and cathode. We use different materials for anode and cathode. Remember the reactor which is being used is common for electrolyzer and the fuel cells. So this PEM is being used not only in fuel cells, it is used in the electrolyzer where we do wastewater treatment also. So in my PhD work, I have done some wastewater treatment for which we have designed this type of PEM fuel cells or solid polymer electrolyte reactor. Okay, SPE reactor we call it that way. So we, have, we make this thing. So usually these fuel cells are like uh, with attachment you know, this membrane uh, PEM fuel cells are kept in between some bipolar plates and which will closed with which will be supported with some metal frames so that we tighten it we have make a complete fuel cell setup so this is this is again number of uh, this type of PEM fuel cells can be kept and they can be tightened in a big uh, frame metal frame so thereby we can we can multiply the uh, if a uh, number of uh, one, one, one cell can produce 0.8 volt, 10 cells can produce uh, 8 volts, right? So that way we can have a multi, uh, you can have a fuel cell stack. What is a fuel cell stack? It is n number of fuel cells kept in series, uh, okay? So in a single arrangement, okay? So each fuel cell will be having a flow field plate, which is bipolar plates, we call it as bipolar plates which provides the, which will have a flow field through which your uh, gases, hydrogen and oxygen and even whatever byproducts which are being formed will be flowing through the flow field, which will be reaching the cathode surface or anode surface. They will be reaching through by passing through this type of thing. Okay. 
and this is some of the catalysts which we have developed for example this anode and cathode we are talking about so instead of using 100 percent platinum because only it is at the surface the platinum surface the reaction is taking place adsorption and the desorption and the reaction so instead of using 100 percent pl platinum it is always uh, economical to use a 10 weight percent platinum supported on vulcan carbon or uh, platinum supported on carbon anode tubes or exfoliated graphene okay so that way this uh, any precious metal with 10 n weight percentage it can vary from 5 percent 10 percent 20 percent 30 percent so its efficiency varies for different applications okay so platinum supported on carbon copper thalassine and supported on carbon nanotube even sometimes some uh, <coughs> low cost copper and copper mesh has been made so this is my phd work you can see the membrane electrode assembly which i have prepared uh, platinum supported on carbon copper, copper thalassine and supported on carbon nanotube or uh, copper electrode deposited on copper mesh all that so what we do is we keep this membrane electrode assembly and we use some support okay uh, so then we keep this flow filled bipolar plate which will have in the cooling system also we can because if you want to maintain a particular temperature we know that it is an exo fuel cell reaction is an exothermic reaction so we will be having in within the bipolar plates there will be cooling water flow arrangement also just like your heat exchangers okay so it's like a jacketed wet case vessel within these bipolar plates the cooling water will be circulated okay so this your two bipolar plates kept on either side of this membrane electrode assembly and which will be fixed tightly in using a metal supports okay so using this nut and nuts and bolts will tighten it to get this thing so to the anode side and the cathode side we connect the wiring work okay so that's how we prepare a solid polymer electrolyte membrane reactor okay so which can be either used as fuel cell for applications or it can be used for electrolysis or wastewater treatment okay at uh, to prepare this membrane electrode assemblies Synthesis of a highly dispersed electrocatalyst phase is in conjunction with the high metal loading on carbon support is the key issue and mostly Vulcan carbon is being used if you are using for research purposes and any activated these are all activated carbon three are, these three are uh, different uh, well, activated carbons which are commercially available and they have their own BET surface area which is around per unit mass how much uh, surface area is available so if you use acetylene black it will be around surface area will be around 50 specific surface area that is uh, surface area per unit mass so that is uh, around 50 meter square per gram if you use vulcan carbon which is around five times more than that and if you use kitchen black which is the costliest one uh, you are going to have almost a thousand meter square per gram specific surface area okay so what is the difference the surface area is low is the dispersion is going to be less that is your so, uh, deposition of your precious metal uh, dispersion will be less and you are going to have high mass transport whereas if it is high surface area we are going to have high dispersion and low mass transport because of the micro pores sizes available in the system okay so this is why this anode or cathode material which is supported on a Vulcan carbon or carbon support uh, what is the BET surface area will play a major role in providing the resistance to mass transfer and if you look at how we have prepared the catalyst in my work as I told you we prepared platinum on carbon, platinum on carbon nanotube or platinum on graphene can be prepared how it can be done in different ways because it is like deposition of your uh, your precious metal on a catalyst support even they also act as a catalyst remember even vulcan carbon acts as a catalyst but the role is going to be different the activation level is going to be different okay so when you support these two the synergistic effect will be there so they will be acting as a good catalyst Okay. so how we do is first we wait uh, say for example i want to prepare some uh, 500 milligrams of platinum on carbon so what i will do 10 weight percent of 500 is platinum so out of 500 10 percent is 50 milligrams so i will take 50 milligrams of the catalyst 
and I will be using some solvent. I will be dissolving it and stirring it well. Then uh, it will be dissolved in the solution. Then we will add this 98 percentage of carbon. So in out of 500, it is going to be 450 milligrams of carbon, which is the catalyst support and catalyst we diffuse them together so either way we do first we take catalyst support first we dissolve the carbon into the system then we dissolve the catalyst which is 10 weight percent platinum into the system so that way both are dissolved into the system so when we continually mechanically stir it or sono chemically stir it so you have the catalyst support on which the catalyst material getting deposited on it okay so after doing a washing and drying at 10 degrees Celsius, uh, we remove filtration has to be done. Uh, so through filtration, we remove the associated solvents, all that. So finally, we get the catalyst being prepared. So once we get this catalyst prepare, prepared, we will be making a catalyst ink. Okay, so in through ink formation, after catalyst is prepared, there are different ways in which the catalyst can be coated on a carbon paper. So what we did is we prepared a catalyst ink. So by doing some binding agents, so, so naphian solution and a solvent ethanol and water. So we mix it and we prepare a ink preparation. But we prepare it in such a way that one microliter of this ink is equal to one microgram because we should know how much catalyst we are loading, right? So how much, what is the mass of the catalyst which is being used in the system? So if I write uh, one ml is used, which means that one milligram of catalyst is deposited. So that like that, we make a composition such that we make a catalyst ink, which is supported on this carbon paper, and then which is used, put it in a one centimeter square area or 0.5 centimeter square area. If it is a large scale application, two centimeter square, five centimeter square like that we make a catalyst thing because it is it should match the membrane length right so what is the square area of this uh, square feet area of this membrane accordingly we'll make the catalyst also so anode and cathode will be prepared in such a way similar way and we'll be keep putting it on a copper glass support and we'll connect it with a copper wire to give the electrical circuit okay so this is how we prepare a catalyst okay as I explained to you, we take 10 weight percent platinum and carbon, so they which is to be used as a cathode, and we can use 40 weight percent platinum and carbon coated on my commercial microporous coated GDL gas diffusion layer, which is used as the anode. So we use some hydraulic hot press to sandwich the uh, these membranes with the anode and the cathode to prepare the MEA. So for example, as I told you platinum on carbon 1.5 centimeter square deposition was done on a carbon paper then we used the naphian membrane which is again activated by pre-treating all that so the standard procedures are followed so we prepare this mea assembly uh, between by doing the sandwich between anode and cathode okay so thus prepare this mea will be conditioned in a 0.5 molar hclo 4 solution for 12 hours before electrolysis or a fuel cell application was done in a SPE reactor in a batch mode or a recirculation mode. Okay. So if you look at the advantages associated with the PEM fuel cells, this cells electrolyte is an hydrated polymer. The cell is a hydrated polymer instead of usually a liquid. So that means it's easy to use. Okay. So there is no, we, we different angles they can be kept. Right? So you can say that it will work in any orientation. It's like a liquid means you have restriction in the angle of uh, installation, installation, right? And because the membrane is lightweight uh, in comparison to liquid electrolytes, it's low weight and the fabrication is also much easier. Okay. However, in comparison to the liquid electrolytes, remember in liquid the ionic conductivity is going to be more. Whereas in this solid electrolytes, solid polymer electrolytes, the conductivity is relatively low in comparison to the liquid phase acid solutions okay which is used as the electrolyte and it restricts the membranes are there it has to be used with hydrated water it restricts the application of the operating temperature okay so it has to be operated at low temperature operation and its startup is very quick and there are no 
corrosive liquid involved in this system of PEM fuel cells and it can work in any orientation and this membrane electrode assemblies will allow a yeah, compact cell formation. So it's very thin as we were discussing about the thickness of these PEM fuel cells. It's very low 200 micrometers kind of thing and support is around 300 micrometers. Okay. Coming to the desired characteristics of the membrane. So, if membrane, we know that what is the role of an electrolyte. If you are clear about what is the role of an electrolyte, you will be able to answer this question. Okay. So, what are the functions of this um, electrolyte? Electrolyte does three job mainly, right? One is it is allowing, selectively allowing the ions to pass through it. Number two, it is not allowing electrons to pass through it and it does not allow the raw materials or the byproducts to pass through it. Okay, so if you remember these three, you will be able to answer these questions. And with respect to mechanical stability, we can tell what is the desired characteristic of the membrane. So what is about the ionic conductivity? The purpose of the electrolyte itself is to conduct more, right? So that means we know the answer is high. The ionic conductivity should be high. Yes. So if you know the answer, you can comment your answers for these four. I will be checking over it and give you uh, my feedback. Okay. Now, what is the permeability to the reactant gases, either the oxygen and the hydrogen crossing over across the electrolyte? It should be zero ideally or it should be low. Okay. What about its resi resistance to its oxidation or hydrolysis? It should be high. And what about its mechanical stability? It should be high. Okay, so these are the desired characteristics of a membrane. So between bipolar plates, electrodes are kept. Okay. So it, as I told you, it's a fuel cell stack means you'll have n number of fuel cells arranged in a order. Now, coming to the bipolar plates, so now coming to the components of these fuel cells, we have, we'll discuss in detail about Nafian membrane in the next lecture. In this lecture, we will focus on these bipolar plates. A bipolar plate is used to interconnect the anode of one cell to the cathode of the other cell. Remember, in uh, when you make a uh, n number of fuel cell stack, this bipolar plates acts as an interconnector. So, uh, that means what? It will have flow field. When you have a single fuel cell, the bipolar plates will have only flow field in one side. Whereas, if it is a multiple fuel cell stack, Usually, these bipolar plates will be having a flow field in both sides of it. So, that means it is acting like an interconnector the, of the anode to the cathode of the another cell. So, it must evenly distribute the reactant gases over the surface of the anode and oxygen over the cathode side. So, in it, same bipolar plate, in one side we will be passing the hydrogen, in another side we will be passing the oxygen so that will it should allow the reactant gases to evenly distribute all along the cross section area of the fuel cell as i said if it is 1 cm square or 5 cm square or even bigger size what if, if in only 25 percentage of the places we are having the liquid or raw material available in rest of the places there is no reaction taking place that means there is no proper space utilization for the active surface area available at the surface of the anode or the cathode. So that's why this bipolar plate should ensure that these raw materials, particularly your hydrogen and oxygen should be reaching or diffusing through the gas diffusion layer and be available at the anode and the cathode for the respective reactions to take place at anode and the cathode. Okay. So if you look at the design consideration, so the electrical contact should be as large as possible. The plate should be thin because we are talking about a thin compact fuel cell, PEM fuel cell. So we should be able to make these bipolar plates with very thin uh, thickness so that uh, it can provide enough stability to the system. Okay, And the gas needs to be flow across. That should not be sticking to the surface because remember it is like micro channels. So through these micro channels, if there is any blockage, any poison or any foreign material goes and locks the path, so there will not be any proper flow of raw material to the surface thereby the efficiency of the fuel cell will be decreasing right 
So that way we this type of bipolar plates are designed such that the liquids will be the gases will be passing through it easily. Okay. And often these factors are antagonistic to each other. For exam, example, uh, if large the larger the contact area will reduce the width of the gas channels, right? So that way there should be a trade-off between all the parameters that we discuss. So if you want to design an ideal flow field design. Uh, what and all we can expect is number one the design should be providing sufficient mass transfer as i told the diffuse mass transfer that is a supply of hydrogen and oxygen to all over the surface area of the anode and cathode is required so that way it should it is expected an excellent mass transport of the reactants to and the products from the catalyst layer with a proper water balance to achieve a moist electrolyte with minimal flooding of uh, dm and the channels under a wide range of operating temperatures okay we have discussed about initially itself there should not be too much of water in the system and there should not be too low water in the system we should have a minimum water present in the membrane so that it is saturated to uh, allow the conduction of ions through the membranes okay and with respect to electron transport excellent electron transport to and from the uh, catalyst layers so that this bipolar plate should be doing because through it, it has to send the electrons to the external circuit well right so that way there should be the electron transport uh, uh, ability should be very good and we know that heat is being generated in the acid the reaction of this water hydrogen plus oxygen forming water is an exothermic in nature where heat is liberated along with emf and the water so that the adequate heat transport to the coolant channel as i said these bipolar plates will be like a jacketed kettle where we will be having a cooling water system passing through it so that adequate heat transport to the coolant channel should be available in the flow field design and as much as possible yeah we see when in a, in a pipe in a straight line a straight pipeline and there is a flow of fluid there will be pressure drop right we can if it is laminar flow we can calculate using Dar darcy equation uh, darcy weisbach equation or higgins poiseuille's equation if it is laminar flow darcy weisbach equation if it is turbulent flow right but if it is through the small micro channels or flow channels we want to have a minimum pressure drop so we should have expect a low pressure drop from the inlet section to exit section so that's what is expected from a ideal flow flow fuel flow field design and cost associated with it mechanical strength associated with it all should be there okay so the design should be compact okay so that way so these are some of the expected thing so if you look at the uh, pm fuel cell showing how these bipolar plates are there and the end plate if it is at the one end it is not the flow field at the both field okay end plate means flow field is there in the only one side after that for each uh, sandwich or you call the membrane electrode assembly you will have bipolar plates with double side flow field so through this flow fields only the your hydrogen and oxygen will be passing through okay so these are some of the flow fields if you look at the new research paper daily people people are working on to improve the efficiency of the bipolar plates so particularly mechanical engineers and design engineers and cfd modeling people computational fluid dynamics if you are interested so people will be working on this type of um, different new flow field because nowadays 3d printer has come whatever you are making it a cad diagram you are able to achieve that in a practical design right so that way the new new uh, flow fields are being developed and its a study and its efficiency are being reported in the literature and if you, even some of the nature inspired flow field designs for these PEM fuel cells are being reported. So in the flow field can be very simple. If you see serpentine means snake, how the snake is moving. If you know the old model mobile phones, we had the snake game, right? Nowadays it is all not there in the Android phones. So this serpentine uh, type of flow field is the simple one. And there are parallel flow, parallel and serpentine, a mix of parallel and serpentine and intergitated a mesh type, a super uh, spiral serpentine, are some of the standard designs which are being used in the bipolar plate manufacturing 
okay so even some people are making a uh, design uh, with a new new mem as we call no, that uh, inspired from the nature a symmetric xylem like channel structure of a typical leaf uh, type of uh, flow channel is being done and somebody make uh, optimized design uh, and somebody makes a parallel channel flow field design which incorporates a murray's branching law design from curie so this type of uh, new flow field uh, or the bipolar plates have been reported in the literature and some of them are being used in the industries this is a real photograph which is commercially being used one is a parallel flow right hand side and in the left hand side you can see a uh, um, you can see a serpentine type uh, it's like continuous so there is so for example so if you say from uh, another cell the reactant is entering through this hole so that flows through this channel so it passes through this and it passes across it's like a snake it is moving left right like it's like in temple there will be queue right if you go to yadagiri temple or tirupati temple anywhere you have to pass through even though if you walk straight it may be very simple but they'll make it through follow a big queue right so you have to go through the each line all the obstacles you will pass through then you will be leaving at the point right so that way this is a serpentine flow field is there the fluid will be flowing either it may be if it is anode side we are going to have hydrogen flowing through this if it is cathode side we are going to have oxygen or air flowing through this type of flow field okay so this is a another type of flow field where parallelly water is flowing uh, then so sorry parallelly the hydrogen or oxygen is flowing across all these fluids and exiting at the other end okay so that is one type of design okay and if you look at the material properties of the bipolar plates we have, it has to be taken in count into what as what are the characteristics are there so we should have a specific electric conductivity heat conductivity gas permeability and it should be mechanically stable right corrosion resistance to the different environment because we are we are having acidic and electrolyte may be there hydrogen is there oxygen is there we are having uh, dealing with water humidity and we are having heat being generated so it should be corro corrosive resistant material and uh, it should have some minimum stiffness cost also should be as low as possible okay so we have to make uh, this kind of bipolar plates so that they are thin for a maximum stack volume they are lightweight for a minimum stock mass stack mass and it should be able to be produced quickly with a short cycle time and this various and difficult specification which must be met along with the fact that modern electrodes require very little catalytic platinum which means that bipolar plate is being the most expensive part of any modern fuel cell so that way working on bipolar plates is a, one of the challenging and interesting research area for people to work on particularly the cft people do a lot of research in doing flow field design for bipolar plates catalyst people make a lot of uh, low cost catalyst with uh, different catalyst supports okay so pem fuel cells without bipolar plates what you what you can say bipolar plates may provide excellent contact between the cells but they are expensive and complex that's why some of the manufacturers even the small industrial scale they choose a different technique to link the cell instead of bipolar plates what we can do cells could be connected simply edge to edge reducing the possibility of leakage some manufacturer like intelligent energy they produced the cells with stainless steel base bases through which the hydrogen channels will be passing through and the cathode current collector is a porous metal and these individual cells are simply stacked with a piece of corrugated stainless steel between them so that's a simple solution which may gain popularity but they are at the initial stages okay so that way the pem fuel cell without bipolar plates are also being researched coming to the performance of the pem fuel cells so we are going to discuss about thermodynamics of uh, fuel cells in next lecture so before that let us look, look into this uh, what is the voltage that is possible to produce from a pem fuel cell uh, can achieve up to 0.7 to 0.8 volt at a full power a typical cell has, uh, can provide up to 0.6 amperes for each square centimeter of area cross section area and you can we have seen commercial cell with an active surface area of 200 centimeter square is reported to have a current around 120 amp and a power of 80 to 100 watts okay 
and if you look at the lifetime of a pem fuel cell it is typically around 10000 hours so this is low for many stationary applications where operational lifetimes are around 10 to 20 years okay which is around 90000 hours to 90000 hours okay so that way the pem fuel cell has a long way to go to cover up with the operational lifetime uh, which is common for other technologies so but it is sufficient for automotive applications where a lifetime is around 4000 hours has been considered to be adequate so that way instead of 4000 hours it is providing 10000 hours means so that is sufficient so okay so that way uh, recent cells have claimed a lifetime lifetime of around 40000 hours which would be suitable for some even stationary applications where intermittent rather than continuous use is required okay we know that in stationary applications like our apartments all these places and there is a regular power cut then we go for this alternative energy things right so there are wide range of stationary applications of pem fuel cells but they are yet to reach the um, commercially acceptable stage as i told you in, rather than the compact lightweight or light ma lightweight or light volume or light space occupancy all that uh, overall efficiency is a major criteria when people choose a particular fuel cell for stationary application so there why it has to compete with other things also okay if you look at the early development they have been directed at a large stationary cell stacks the capacities were around this as, as small as uh, 250 kilowatts but there has been one one megawatt uh, utility applications however the largest units today they are likely to be below 100 kilowatts Meanwhile, PEM units of around the 750 watts are being installed in homes in Japan under the government-backed program. As I told you, domestic applications only will increase the demand for this type of PEM fuel cells. Even in Europe, interest is mostly for PEM fuel, fuel cells for portable and standby powers, as well as for domestic applications. Okay, so in middle of the 21st century, particularly when we have started using. e vehicles right so e bikes uh, come into picture and then in the all the of them pem fuel cell is being used so thereby the largest uh, number of fuel cells which is sold annually both in terms of numbers or in terms of capacity they were shipped by the manufacturers are pem fuel cells so that is the advantage of the pem fuel cells okay so with the introduction of the electric vehicles this pem fuel cells have reached the market okay so that way pem fuel cells are mainly used in this transport vehicles okay and if you look at the challenges associated with the pem fuel cells as we know we have seen lot of ancillary units are needed bipolar plates are required a proper design is there so manufacturing and uh, manufacturing of the requirement of the ancillary components are an important challenge in the pem fuel cells because the cost needs to be reduced in that part okay and if you look at the expensive parts uh, catalyst is the expensive part and bipolar plates also important okay and we have to manage with because when you say bipolar plates how the water and the heat management heat is being removed from the bipolar plates comes into picture so that always there can be there is a scope to improve the efficiency with which the water is being removed from the system and the heat is being removed from the system and if you look at the durability of the components there is still scope to improve that okay and freeze thaw cycling and frozen start compatibility is a big challenge remember we have seen the pem fuel cell which in the flow filled water is uh, means water is a product there so if you are not removing the water entirely from the pem fuel cell after usage you let me say this fuel cell thing water is not, not removed from the fuel cell throughout the fuel cell water is there and why parked my vehicle now it is winter the temperature has gone down 10 degree 5 degree zero in us and in several countries we see minus 10 degrees celsius minus 20 degrees celsius right so under this condition what happens is there will be ice formation within the fuel cell so it, the moment you put your key in the fuel cell powered vehicle electric bikes or e vehicles what happens is it won't start because there is no flow of water right so that is called freeze thaw cycling so first thing is to remove the whatever ice formed it needs to be defreezing has to be done so that is hampering the start up during the winter so that may cold countries application of this type of pem fuel cell have some limitations okay 
so that is the problem which needs to be addressed so something has to be done so that water is not staying within the system after we use the uh, that particular vehicle okay with uh, pem fuel cells so if you look at the applications of the pem fuel cells they are mainly used in the portable and automobile applications in the stationary applications for the distribution of generation of electricity and for co generation of electricity heat and water they have the scope for applications okay so in this lecture we have discussed about the pump fuel cells where we have seen the hydrogen is fed to the anode where a catalyst which is separating the hydrogen's negatively charged electrons from the positively charged ions which is proton so the electrons will not be passing through the electrolyte membrane uh, whereas it will be passing through an external circuit so that movement of electrons is an electrical circuit okay so the protons however will be moving through the electrolyte to the cathode where they will combine with the oxygen and electrons to form the by products water and heat okay. so the amount of power produced by the fuel cell will depend upon various factors mainly that the type of fuel cell what is the fuel cell size cross section area of the anode cathode the temperature at which we are operating it and what is the pressure at which the gases are being supplied to the system the flow rate the pressure all that will be contributing to the power generation by a single fuel cell and the overall power of generation will depend upon how many fuels are kept in a single stack okay and how multi how many stacks are being used that all will contribute to the uh, overall power generation okay so still a single fuel cell which produces enough electricity for only the smallest applications so to provide the power needed for most applications so individual fuel cells are combined in series into a fuel cell stack a typical fuel stack may contain even 100 or uh, number of individual fuel cells okay so that way you can get a more power output okay so uh, if you want to compare this pem fuel cell with our other uh, fuel cells which we have already discussed phosphoric acid and alkaline fuel cell here the electrolyte used is polymer membrane here the electrolyte is polymer membrane whereas in phosphoric acid liquid phosphoric acid is being used as the electrolyte in alkaline fuel cell liquid koh is being used as the electrolyte and here the charge carrier is uh, your uh, proton h plus ions phosphoric acid it is h plus ions whereas in alkaline fuel cells it is oh minus ion hydroxyl ions okay in operating temperature of the pem fuel cell can be around 20 degrees celsius to 80 degrees celsius whereas phosphoric acid fuel cell can be operated up to 200 degrees celsius alkaline fuel cells also can be operated up to 200 degrees celsius mostly platinum is being used as the catalyst in all the three cases discussed so far and the pem fuel cell is advantages over the other two you know, by the way that this pem fuel cell can even take methanol as the fuel okay so that we are going to discuss in detail about sub classifications of pem fuel in the uh, coming lectures so other types like molten carbonate fuel cell and solid oxide fuel cells we are going to discuss it under the tag of high temperature fuel cells so next two to three to four lectures we will be discussing about the thermodynamics of fuel cells we are going to discuss about um, components of uh, pem fuel cell remember pem fuel cell is widely used so we are going to discuss in detail about the components particularly this nafion membrane water uptake what are its desired uh, parameters so that we have to check all that uh, we are going to discuss in detail about pem fuel cells little more then we are going to discuss about sub classification of pem fuel cells like direct methanol fuel cells then we will move towards high temperature applications uh, fuel cells which are molten carbonate fuel cells and solid oxide fuel cells okay so that's what we are going to do i hope you are gearing up and you don't miss any lectures we are going to do some numerical solves in the next lecture so be stay tuned thank you so much for joining my classroom in this lecture number 6 we have seen the important type of fuel cell that is polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cells pem fuel cells and we have seen its construction we have seen its applications we have seen the scope of pem fuel cells in the transport vehicles and we have seen the advantages and disadvantages associated with it we have to discuss about thermodynamics of fuel cells so in lecture number 7 we are going to discuss about thermodynamics of fuel cells and solve few numericals stay tuned